So, uh, oh. mm. maybe I will do it like <laughs> this, yeah. So, uh, I try to make a presentation with Tim Oxley about type classes that seem most difficult for beginners. We had uh, uh, certain stumbling box blocks, in particular the fact that I got MC <coughs> today and Tim got wedding uh, two weeks ago. But uh, at least what is there to present, I will present. And if uh, there is anything that feels unfinished, please forgive me. And there will be certainly an opportunity next time for me to improve on that. Certainly, for, for all the Haskell code in here is fault of mine, not Tim. So you can complain to me directly. And yeah, Tim was very, very helpful in finding what is the most difficult and what are the difficult things that we might want to talk about. I'm afraid that I kind of trimmed the topic because I removed the common ads part, for example. I decided that it feels too much unfinished. So let's try. So first the goal of this talk is to give some intuition behind how type classes work and what they are useful for. Uh, if you are not real Haskeller like 100% of your time, it may be a useful way to learn certain de design patterns that are ubiquitous in functional programming. And if you are real, real beginners, we will tell that monads are not scary. Basically, the things that monads cover usually in this Haskell code are much more scary, and I will give examples of that. So the first thing and the most important, why do we need type classes? So basically, if this is for the, this is 101, this slide and, and few following, just for these people that did not yet use type classes a lot. So for example, we can define addition on integers as a plus operator that takes integer, takes the second integer and returns an, uh, another integer. But then we also want to have addition on doubles. So we take two doubles and we return a double. And the most natural solution would be to say that for any numeric class, or any numeric type alpha or a here, we take two values of this type and return the same type. And this is solution that is successful used in many languages, like uh, you see this operator plus in C++. You have similar construct in Smalltalk. But in Haskell, we want to type it strongly and to make sure that it doesn't bulk so we want to have unique semantics at compile time. And the, the solution is to say exactly this, that this type class is sat, uh, constrained is satisfied that you have a, a, a type alpha that is of certain class of types. Another way of saying that is that it's conditioned on a type. So if we have a type that has equalities, that we can compute equality easily on this type. We can mark it as EQA, and we can use equality operator that returns Boolean. <coughs> it's also a hierarchy of properties, because some type classes, they have to be subclasses of the other classes. So this hierarchy is basically the same as in object-oriented languages, but at the type level. So it always applies to type. In, in object-oriented languages, usually you have hierarchy on the object level. So you know that object is also instance of, of uh, the, the super class. And that's how you define the semantics. Here we say the type is instance of a certain class. And the classes are related to each other somehow. It's a type-safe uh, correspondent of virtual method and call mecha mechanism also. 
and it's uh, the most common way of expressing design patterns in Haskell, besides higher order functions. So most important type classes probably are monads, which express general, general sequencing computation along with monad transformers, functors, applicative, uh, foldables, traversables, foldables, and traversables with skip for the other talk. And to start with the hardest, we have a definition of the monad according to philosophy of Leibniz. <laughs> they are indivisible and hence ultimately simple entities, such as an atom or a person. So you cannot just split the person in two halves and say they are they are two different people, yeah? So if you start splitting, you will subtract something inherently. And this is actually the intuition how we, uh, how we use IO class in a way in, in Haskell, that we cannot look into computation that is expressed by IO without breaking something. We just can execute it. And they are the general problem to problem to to, uh, to general s solution to the problems of sequencing, in particular asynchronous I/O computation or exception handling, as I show now. So the simple JavaScript example, just in case anybody of you uses JavaScript, it's kind of a little short because normally you have uh, these multiple nestings as as many as ten of them. And it basically looks in this way that first you read file A, and then when you read this file, you attach the callback to the function that takes an argument and reads another file, and possibly error. And then you concatenate these files and do something else with them. So basically, you have to chain the callbacks and you often reach something that is called callback hell. If you search on the internet for callback hell, you will see a lot of examples. And unfortunately, for some reason, I think I just wrote this presentation, so so I will I will fix it on the spot, which is very very bad. But at least we'll see it. I, I think the presentation was just assuming that. We have a bigger projector. No, not this one. Yes. Oh, so it should be this one. Okay. Ah, yes. So in Haskell, you can express it by basically using read file function and then binding the result, which is a little bit easier to read, even without do notation. And uh, as, as Omar already told, the, the idea of the monad class is that you have the return operator that injects any value into the monad, and you bind two monadic operations. The first is is normal operation that returns uh, the value of type alpha, and the second takes the value of type alpha and returns the, the action or, or monadic value of the, the something that returns value of type beta, and you can compose them. There is also an alternative formulation that allows you to use for join function. Uh, either of them can be easily translated. And this is my favorite example of, of how you don't program. But unfortunately, it's very common that you have to program like this in C. So we have a simple C program that opens a file, checks for errors, then reads a buffer of the size of 4 kilobytes, then checks for the errors during the reading. Then it follows with uh, checking that the header is not too small after passing the header. Each time we check for error, we have to add another level of if then else. Until at the end, after checking uh, headers, number of rows, and the fact that the parsing is complete, we can return the result. So we can say that 
there is a common pattern here. After each operation, we need to check for errors. And if there is error, we need to basically abort all the other operations. You can do it using go to, but Dijkstra would shun at it. So maybe we would like to have a structured way of saying that after every operation, we check whether the, we have a valid result and we continue to with the following computation. And this is how you do it with explicit binds. So basically, you say that you have some left value that is exception or right value that is correct. And you can bind the functions together in a monad with a do notation. It's even simpler. You sim simply finish with the adding the catch on the top level and and using run either, which is either monad. And then you, it seems quite natural. Uh, you just execute following actions and make sure that they return either right value or left error. So that's called monad either from the either type that is used there. You have the fail over there. The fail is not, the error from the fail is not captured by that system, correct? So actually, for monad either, it depends on the formulation. We we here, we use the formulation that fail is corresponding to left. Oh, OK. The return left. So and the implementation is pretty, pretty simple. We just stack either on top of uh, some other monad, in this case, maybe IO. And we use the left. A for error and write B for the correct result. And basically, each time that we execute two following actions, we check that it's right value. And then we continue, or if it is an error, we just ignore the following part of the computation. A similar type class that is ubiquitously used is functor. And in the simplest idea, it's some box that holds the values of type alpha, but it can also uh, hold values of any other type. So the basic operation that is functorial in, in a categorical manner would be applying the some morphism or, or function that here is a first parameter that transforms the things of type alpha into things of type beta. And this is basically how FMAP works. The applicative is functor that has the zipping operation. So it can use the function and apply it to every member of the functor or, or everything that is in the box. The simple example is the, the applicative on list where we apply the function the, the, the <coughs> functions in the list to to everything that is on the list. Another one that is very useful is category, which is something that looks like a function but it's not. So it's basically anything that can be composed. So it has to have identity object that goes from uh, type A to type A, and also can be composed. And simplest example of category is lenses, which basically go from type A to type B. And they are almost like a function. So the get is basically the function part of the category instance in here. But you can also go in the other way. So if you have the object beta and object alpha, then you construct uh, back the object alpha with its fragment changed. And how I would use it is mostly for timer presentations or something similar. So we can just define it date time, uh, time and hours uh, lenses. And the date time goes from uh, date time with time zone into date time, and so on. 
and then whenever you want to set the hour as integer within daytime with time zone, you basically set and then compose the lenses behind it. Arrow is another useful class, which is also generalization of function. So it's in a way like category that you can compose it. Then you also have something similar as in the, in the uh, monad that you can inject any function using pure into an arrow. So if we have a function from in to out, we can inject it to an arrow as, as arrow from in to out. The second thing is that any two arrows can be composed as arrow on, on a tuple, basically. So that means that any Cartesian product you have in the arrow. And the last thing is that you can always split that uh, for any, any arrow from input, you can, and the other arrow from the same input, you can basically use them both on, on the given input and get the uh, product of the results. There is also a small part, which is that in the arrow, you can drop any part of this Cartesian product that allows you to basically express the generic data flow computation or computation graph. And that was kind of very, very, very fast demonstration. So the questions, complaints? <laughs> Just jump from the jump is question from type class to the <laughs> arrow. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the, it was, OK. So yeah, maybe I should tell more <laughs> in detail. But the, the, uh, the idea is very simple, that in, in each of these cases, you have a design pattern that uses few operators, define few operators together, few functions that are useful on many different types, like fmap. Yeah? So you can use fmap on lists of anything. You can use fmap on IO. So it's basically a design pattern in, in each of these cases. And I, I'm not sure why it does it this this formulation of design pattern have the reputation of being complicated because the, the underlying concepts are in a way quite simple. So arrow is anything that can be uh, mm. constructed from the function. Yeah? So you have a simple function and you construct the arrow. Category is anything that can be composed, basically. So they are like functions, but maybe not. you cannot simply construct them from functions because in case of the lenses they are bidirectional yeah so we can always set and get from the given value there are also there are also isomorphic lenses iso lenses that are have this similar property they are like category with inverse operation I mean, I if you if you use the the, the design pattern of, of say the command pattern in object-oriented languages, I'm not sure if you hear about it. It's very similar to to free monad basically. So you can pretty much translate any of the object-oriented pattern into type class in Haskell, or most of them, I except for callable pattern because we already have that we can basically use higher the functions. Can you give me an example of an uh, instance of arrow, like a particular type? So the, of, of course, the simplest ins instance of arrow that people actually can use is, is the function itself. It's like identity arrow. So there, there is nothing. But the second thing is actually you can express parser combinators as arrows. As I said, data flow computation is like the simplest example that is actually useful. So you basically make an arbitrary data flow or a VHDL computation, and then it, you can run it asynchronously. 
if it's side effect free. Why is so spreadsheet is, a, is such an example, oh. yeah? Uh -huh. That's why we acted like, but FRP used a lot of errors, right? Yeah. So the biggest advantage of like uh, parser combinator for arrow more than the like applicative parser combinator is that for handling a synchronous case. Well, for parsing this wouldn't work because the the in I, if you consider uh, how normally it's formulated as an arrow, mm -hmm. you still have this sequentiality. So it depends whether it's on the left side mm -hmm. or on the right side yeah. of the expression, and depending of this, you have different ordering of the expressions. Yeah. But it it's useful for data flow computation where you say that it doesn't matter, so it's mm -hmm. commutative. Yeah. So basically, commutative arrow is something like yeah. simple circuits, yeah. and and parsers are not circuits. So, is there any known library on package that uh, is using arrow uh, parser combinator? Yes, because the 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 advantage of using this formulation instead of monad is that you have explicit resource control. Mm -hmm. So you have to drop something out of the Cartesian product whenever you don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know where you drop it. Mm -hmm. And in the monad, when you bind something in theory, it's up to the compiler to optimize out that you will not ever use it again. Mm. Yeah. So basically, if you look at the bind here, so it basically tells that uh, this fun function MB R yeah. can have any long-term dependency on the uh, input. Previous one, yeah. Okay. yeah, so it can use it long, long after it has been parsed. Mm. Yeah. And this is the weakness of yeah. of because it's right. yeah. 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 There is also m maybe that that that's not uh, kind of sideways because I aim to like make the, the basic type classes simple uh, but there is mm -hmm. kind of advanced time type class uh, set of type classes actually mm -hmm. they call are called the generalized arrows mm -hmm. and there is patch for GHC compiler that basically translate uh, translates any lambda expression mm -hmm. into reshuffling something that it looks very similar to arrows with few more operators to have explicit resource control there. Okay. So that at this moment, if we are going to write a series like parser, then you would either go to the arrow parser combinator or the applicative parser combinator library, but not using parsec or if for uh, more than simple stuff. Right? So you mean for the Maybe so some there is a big progress in, in limiting resource usage in case of, I think, Atoparsec. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And I, like honestly, if you have resource problems, yeah, possibly using arrows is, is mm -hmm. a better idea, but but honestly, I'm actually considering re writing my own parser combinator library because I <laughs> I have a lot of ideas in this regard. Yeah. But if I have if I didn't have time to write my own, mm -hmm. because usually if you have a pr big project that like yeah. needs more of the parsers, then yeah. you can schedule a one or yeah. two weeks just for making parser yeah, combinator that. library. But uh, if I didn't have time for <laughs> it. I would probably use uh, use actually monadic parser combinators, okay. but this is only because they are simplest to use. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, so yeah. arrows arrows have a lot of advantages, but yeah. w being simple to use is not one of them. Yeah. Unless you are really into data flow computations, but I I know about people that prefer to construct graphs, mm -hmm. arbitrary graph expressions or data flow expressions, using special kind of monad that is basically deeply embedded DSL mm -hmm. because monads, monadic syntax in maybe monads are not simple but 
monadic syntax is in Haskell makes it much simpler mm -hmm. to yeah, operate on yeah. unique nodes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In the case of that specific instance, like, is there any reason why you aren't polymorphic on the first parameter? Is it just the absence of multi-parameter classes, or what? Uh, polymorphic on the first parameter of of what? Yeah, either. Uh, here, uh, yes, there is there is one one very simple answer. Fail is defined as taking the string argument, That's and and I, w I want to redefine fail. I do not mention it there. That that's the only reason. If I I, I really think the fail should be defined as taking exception argument or something of the that is instance of class error. And that will solve the issue. But as of now, fail in the monad. The first, the problem is the fail is defined in the monad I and not in. Forget it exists. Yeah, it, it is actually very important because what what it gives you is that every pattern matching that fails will be Should silently be converted by the compiler into call to fail yeah. on the missing case, which means that you can do pattern matching control in a way in your monad in a meaningful way I didn't know that, uh, without raising any exception or anything. So you can just have an incomplete case analysis and the empty case will be left to fail? Yes, for example. It's not convenient like until it's string. Like only in the monad economy bind. Okay. That, that, yeah, that's pattern matching only in monad bind, but it's, it's in a way I think there is only small thing missing from this and, and having nearly nearly like complete abstract syntax for, for, for shallowly embedded DSLs where you basically do pattern matching in a variant of the monad and the other variant basically sequences the computation. And the, the the alternative way of formulating it, then you probably have to do something as complex as generalized arrows that I mentioned before. Can we applaud yet? Oh? Can we applaud now? Never mind. Hold, <laughs> it, hold it, you mean? We're oh. good. Ah, okay. <laughs>